Okay, so my, uh, my remit was really to take a very kind of uh, drill down on p uh, the safety data from the clinical trial experience. So unfortunately, safety, safety talks are <laughs> hard to make really interesting because there's lots of tables, but I'll do my very best to, to open it up and make it uh, as engaging as possible. Uh, the relevant conflict here is that I've either been a speaker for, designed clinical trials for, conducted clinical trials, written papers with Abvi, Eli Lilly and Pfizer who make the, uh, all of the relevant jacks. So pretty much every aspect of that I've been involved in over the last six or eight years. So those are relevant conflicts. So Iona's done a beautiful talk explaining the biology of jack stats, uh, signaling pathways and their inhibition. And, and really this is, I'm not gonna recapitulate this, but just to, to show that the, there's a very broad range of issues which are, of signaling pathways relevant to atopic dermatitis that JAK1 in particular takes down. You know, TSLP, IL-31, 4, 13, um, 22, which is involved in epidermal hyperplasia. But on the right-hand side, does, my, does this work? No, I don't know how you, yeah. And, oh yeah, it does. <laughs> so, on the right-hand side, you've heard about interferons. And we talked a little bit about interferonopathies, where in single um, uh, dis inherited disorders of uh, uh, immunity, you might get excess interferon signaling. Jacks can be kind of useful. That's off topic for today. But what's relevant for here is that interferon is obviously important in viral uh, immunity. And you'll see some of the data on where that's uh, relevant. So JAK inhibitors, which have been approved for atopic dermatitis, have Varying selectivity, so you, you're used to the idea of monoclonals being incredibly specific, monoclonal, antibi uh, 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 monoclonal antibodies having very specific epitopes, even on a single cytokine, so the binding site might be different for trilokina versus lebricizumab and so on. Highly, highly specific. JAK inhibitors are the chemical, medicinal chemistry of these is selectivity rather than specificity. So if you give a high enough dose in ex vivo systems, uh, they actually have quite a lot of structural similarity and you'll be able to inhibit all of them. However, the IC50 or the, the concentration that's required to knock down 50% of the activity does vary quite a bit. And what we have, broadly speaking, is that baricitinib is more or less equally suppressive of JAK1 and JAK2 and not so much on TIC2 and not very much on JAK3. Um, abrocitinib is selective for JAK1 and so is upatacitinib, and you can see their relative selectivities for the other jacks on their IC50s. So mostly we're using abrocitinib and upatacitinib in, in the clinic. So just the, I need to tell you a story. So the story about jack safety really goes back to the approval of tofacitinib. Now tofacitinib inhibits jack one, jack three, and a little bit of jack two. It's, it's equally on jack one and three, and if you give high enough dose, It'll take down JAK2 as well. So the story of safety comes uh, and the relationship with the regulators goes back to tofacitinib being approved for rheumatoid arthritis, potentially with methotrexate as well, as a, uh, in patients who were TNF inhibitor e experienced and hadn't uh, succeeded. So when, with the approval, the FDA insisted on, a, on essentially a, a post-marketing uh, safety study a past type study, which was called the oral surveillance study, and that was set up to do, to actively enrich for people at risk of major ad adverse cardiac events and venous thromboembolism. So, the um, the the FDA had concerns that uh, tofacitinib could increase the rate, risk of venous thromboembolism and major adverse cardiac events, and they asked the company to do a post marketing safety study, and that was called the oral surveillance study. So, to put people in that, they needed to load it for people who were more at risk. So everybody in the study had rheumatoid arthritis, they nearly all had previous, previous disease-modifying drugs. They, they had at least one additional risk factor, either they were a smoker, high blood pressure, uh, low HDL, uh, diabetes, history of coronary heart disease or family history, or extra-articular manifestations. So this is a cohort which was loaded for events, and the endpoint was, was triggered by enough people having events, major adverse cardiac events, they needed 103, it's very specific kind of power calculation, and 138 malignancies, including not excluding non-melanoma skin cancer. And this was a randomization. It depended on which continent you were, whether you got um, etanercept 
or uh, adalimumab as your TNF inhibitor. And there were two doses of tofacitinib. So that's how the, the uh, oral surveillance study was set up. It completed in 2022, 20, at the end of 2020. The data cut came out in 2021, and the uh, FDA and other regulators started reviewing this in early 2022. So basically, it was set up as a non-inferiority study. So the idea was that if you were in one of these high-risk categories and you took a TNF inhibitor versus taking uh, the dose of uh, tofacitinib, that you would uh, not be less safe than the TNF inhibitor if you're on the tofacitinib. And the, the par calculation, again, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, was that there wouldn't be a, the upper limit was 1.8, and it, the combined tofacitinib doses exceeded 1.8, uh, even though they crossed the, uh, crossed the zero, all TOFA versus TNFI. And that was considered to have, that they weren't non-inferior, otherwise there was a slight, uh, there was a concern that they were more uh, at risk of causing uh, major adverse cardiac events than TNF inhibitors in this selected group. And it's the same for uh, malignancy, again, uh, a marginal uh, signal over non-inferiority for uh, malignancy. And uh, what's interesting then to look at is the post hoc analysis of this. So trying to identify who are these patients that are getting the risks. And if you're over 65 or ever smoked, that accounted for 80% of the adverse events of special interest, the AAS, uh, AESIs in, in this tofacitinib group. So there's a big signal for age and a big signal for smoking. And the post hoc analysis, which was published uh, in 2022, this is the over pop, overall population looking at the probability of patients getting uh, major adverse cardiac events through the duration of the study, 72 months of the study. You can see overall tofacitinib is more likely to have a major adverse cardiac event. If you split it out into people who were over 65 or who ever smoked, there's quite a big delta between the, the two arms. If you look under 65 and never smoked, you see there's really very little difference between the arms. So there's an interaction really uh, on a, at a global level between age, smoking, and tofacitinib in, in this selected cohort for rheumatoid arthritis. And the same with venous thromboembolism. It's actually even more striking here in the top right-hand side where we look at people over 65 who ever smoked, they are accounting for nearly all of the difference between the two treatment arms in the post hoc. And this is important, obviously, when you come to, to counseling patients and prescribing these drugs. And remember, this is tofacitinib. It's not used for atopic germ. And again, same for malignancy, although the malignancy signal is a bit less differentiated between the, between the two. We can see, again, under 65 and never smoked, it's not so, so much of a... Um, uh, a differentiator. So for most of 2022, the European Medicines Agency had uh, a, an ongoing review that went up through the, the PRAC and eventually got uh, through CHMP and signed off by the European Union. And this essentially is now, because we're in Europe, this is where the, um, the risk minimization strategy for JAK inhibitors came out of the, all of those uh, extensive reviews. So it's recommended in the following patients only if no suitable treatment alternatives are available. Over 65, at major risk of uh, ischemic heart disease, heart attack or stroke. Smokers, or those who have done so for a long time in the past, that's a kind of loose definition. There's no pack years or anything like that. Patients at increased risk of cancer, that's only use it if there's no alternatives. Um, and with caution, patients with risk factors for venous thromboembolism, and reduce the doses in people who are at risk of venous thromboembolism cancer and major cardiovascular problems. So that's kind of in line with where the ETFAD, the European Task Force for AD is. It's not putting a hierarchy of you must use biologics first. And remember, these guidelines apply to rheumatology and gastroenterology as well. So there's JAKs are used in those inflammatory uh, diseases too. So there's no you must try this first because the original starting position was you had to try TNFIs first and that was a very rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease thing. So the, the, the medicines agency looked at JAX as a class that was across all, uh, all conditions, uh, including atopic dermatitis and alopecia areata. So some of the things, they're not really precisely defining the, uh, the, the risks, 
uh, and there's a degree of, of patient uh, and physician discretion. So let's just have a look then at safety studies uh, for these. These are the five-year data for upadacitinib at 15 or 30 milligrams, and there's um, you know 6,000 years of patient exposure at this point. So the the, the registration trials looked at two single uh, monotherapy that was a uh, measure of one and two, and ADOP, which had a, a topical corticosteroids in them. People had a 16-week placebo period, and then they went to long-term out to 260 weeks, which is five years. And that data cut is now available. I'm going to show you some of that. The um, the important thing to remember is it's only the first 16 weeks that you have a, a placebo control period. And once you go beyond that, then you need a comparator group of people. And it's extremely difficult to do that across multiple countries, multiple ages, multiple ethnicities, multiple um, comorbid, comorbid backgrounds, smoking, non-smoking. It's really hard to have a very reliable comparator uh, group as you get out. But let's just go through this. So when we look at these these patients, 2,683, who had at least one dose of 15 or 30 milligrams of upadacitinib, split fairly equally. You've got exposure-adjusted data here now, so the longer it's the, the number of events per exposure is the way we're looking at safety here. In this group, about half of the people in the trials had at least one cardiovascular risk factor, and a half did not have any. And some people, um, you know, had had like, you know three or 4% had three cardiovascular risk factors. And then what we're looking at is the overview up to, a, up to five years at the two doses. And we can see just a small uh, dose-adjusted uh, serious adverse event, 6.7 versus 7.